Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Retro 135 by Riverside RV. We're going to start right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, what we have is, give me a second here, we're going to kind of stage this stuff, get it ready. So we have your coupler right here at the front of your tongue. As this sits, this is going to be in the unlocked position. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start three inches above your ball and drop. We're then going to center your ball and drop underneath the coupler. Uh, we're going to let that jack down uh, once it is fully seated on your ball. We're going to slide this back. Uh, we're paying special attention here that this secondary latch is going to be engaged. That's going to lock that coupler uh, down. Uh, I always go back, give it a secondary kind of pull to make sure it is in fact locked down. Uh, from here, you can go ahead and use a secondary pin to pin back this coupler. That's just a little bit of added protection, whether you choose to actually keep that under lock and key or just use a spring latch kind of pin. Uh, but either way, it's going to be our recommendation to go ahead and pin that back. Now, that doesn't come standard with the unit, so that's going to be an add-on for you. Uh, from there, we can go ahead and run the jack all the way up uh, to the resting position. We're then going to take your toe chains. We are going to cross those underneath the coupler and hook those onto the receiver. Now it is very important that we cross those underneath the coupler. It is state law in Texas. As well as it is state law in Texas that these chains cannot make contact with the pavement at any time. Uh, so skate that line of having enough uh, room to make your turns left or right, um, but not so much that they're going to, of course, make contact with the pavement. Uh, riding right next to those chains is going to be your emergency breakaway. Uh, this is essentially a very important uh, safety feature. It's going to be your last line of defense. Uh, what it's looking to avoid is kind of a runaway camper scenario. Uh, so this is going to ride right next to your tow chains. Uh, if this coupler were to fail and these tow chains were to fail as the two vehicles separated, it's going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system. Uh, essentially pulling that pin, putting full 12 volts to the brakes, uh, again avoiding a, run a runaway camper scenario. Very important that this has its own separate, co separate connection point to the receiver. So whether that be a carabiner or a quick link, uh, that's up to you as long as it, is having, it does have its own separate connection point. Uh, make sure you're allowing, again, enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that this may make contact with the pavement. So what we have here is going to be your seven-way receptacle. This is going to plug uh, into your bumper port. Uh, when this is hooked up to your vehicle at that point, think of it as one large vehicle. This is going to give you function to your uh, tow vehicle's charging, uh, charging system, braking system, tail lights, marker lights, things like that. Uh, again, uh, make sure you have enough slack to make your turns, but not so much that it could drag. Of course, they actually make this on this particular model, this, this a ton, you just have a ton of length here on that cord. Just go ahead and wrap the slack around the jack. Uh, and again, make sure you have uh, enough, but not too much room. Uh, coming up here to the jack, uh, we have easy up or down operation on the switch. It is clearly marked in terms of direction. We also have an on off switch there uh, for a light to not only light your way if you're going to do any coupling or uncoupling after dark, but also to um, you know, give you a point of reference if you are backing up to the unit at dark time. Uh, it does have a manual drive that's going to be found underneath this uh, plug here. Uh, you'll use the corresponding crank handle there on the inside uh, to manipulate that up or down as needed uh, in a, an emergency situation. Uh, directly behind that, we have your 20 pound propane cylinder. Uh, open and close valve on the top, very standard setup here, same variant you're going to find on any gas grill held in place with a wing nut and a tension band. It's up to you on whether you keep this tank with the unit uh, or take advantage of an exchange program uh, that you would find at any filling station. Uh, further back, we have your brand new Interstate Deep Cycle battery. Uh, this is a Group 24 battery. It is a lead acid battery. What that means for you is it does carry some maintenance. Two or three times a year, we're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels. We're going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So you're going to find a clear marked water level underneath those uh, vent panels, and we are just going to maintain that water level with distilled water. Uh, we have a light here to help you further light this area. Um, switches directly underneath the, the light there. So very easy, um, very straightforward. 
Uh, coming around here to the side, we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. Uh, those are for stabilization, they are not for leveling. So for leveling front to back, we're gonna use that main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right is gonna be done with the tires and what's called a leveling kit. So three quarter inch drive nut here on the end of that jack. We're going to come down, uh, make contact with the pavement, and again, a quarter turn more. Now these jacks are going to stay uh, in better shape longer if you, again, remember to use a light touch. Uh, as they age, as that powder coating wears off, if you get in the habit of really muscling these up into position, uh, they may bind on you as they age. Again, come down, make contact with the pavement. Our goal here is just to sure up that floor. Uh, large pass-through compartment here. I'm gonna give you access to a ton of storage. Uh, you will have lights on each side uh, to go ahead and light that up. Uh, excuse me, in the event that you are uh, pulling your gear from that space. Uh, fresh water connection here. Uh, this is going to be our potable water. This is how we're going to fill that onboard water tank. Uh, we're going to stick a drinking water hose directly in here. We're going to fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once full, we cap it off. Uh, this is not naturally pressurized. So what we need to do is uh, use the onboard built-in 12 volt water pump to pressurize that system, draw that water up from the tank to the fixture and make it usable. Uh, down below that, we have your city water connection here. Uh, water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about the city water connection. Uh, reason being is these units are uh, rated for a max of 75 PSI water pressure. Uh, it's very, very important that we do not exceed that limit. Uh, we include a water pressure regulator with your purchase. That regulator is going to hook onto the spigot side of the hose, your water hose or drinking water hose onto that. Uh, and then of course you make your connection onto the camper by rotating this. Uh, I like to keep my water pressure regulator off of the camper itself. Uh, that's going to keep it weight off of these plastic connections here. Six gallon capacity water heater here. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, manufacturer recommends two very specific things. Number one, if the water heater itself is going to be in storage for more than seven days, uh, it is very important that we do go ahead and drain this separate from the rest of the system. They also recommend that when it does come to returning the unit back to service, uh, that we do go ahead and prime it or pump six gallons of water into the unit before using it. So uh, when it comes to draining it, it's very important uh, from a safety standpoint that we follow uh, the co correct procedure. Uh, number one, give it ample time to cool down, at least two or three hours. Uh, once you are confident of the the temperature within the water heater, we can go ahead and cut the inflow of water to the unit as a whole. So if that's the city water connection, we're going to physically turn off that fixture uh, at the valve. And if it's the fresh water connection, we are going to then turn off that onboard uh, water pump. So once we have no new water running to the unit, uh, we are then going to depressurize the water heater itself or the water tank itself. Uh, to do so, we are going to uh, utilize the hot side of any fixture within the unit, whether that's the outside shower here, which is going to be my recommendation, or the, you know, one of the fixtures there on the inside. Uh, to depressurize it, we're just going to turn the hot side of the spigot on. Once we do so, we're going to see a little bit of pressure, a uh, little bit of water come from the actual fixture. Once we don't see water coming uh, from the actual fixture any longer, that means that the unit has been depressurized. It is safe for us to go ahead and drain it. Uh, so your drain plug is here. That's going to be an inch and a 16th socket size. Uh, probably will need an extension as well to get on there. Uh, what we're going to do is go ahead and back that drain plug out. Uh, again, once we've depressurized it, we are safe to do so. It's going to evacuate the remaining, you know, four to five gallons of water from this location. Uh, now on the other side of that drain plug, you're going to find a anode rod. Now that anode rod is a consumable part. It acts like a pass. It acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto the anode rod as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Uh, again, it is a consumable part. I would expect to get a year or two in between anode rod changes. Uh, you'll be well aware of the condition because you're going to be looking at it every single time you drain the water heater, and you're going to be draining the water heater if the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, now this is a dual source water heater when it does come to function. That means that it runs on 110 volts as well as propane gas. The 110 volt heating element switch is going to be right here behind the propane regulator. 
It is clearly marked on and off. Your propane ignition switch is going to be there on the inside. We'll talk about that when we do get to the inside. Uh, manufacturer also recommends that when we return the unit back to service that we do go ahead and prime it uh, because of course it will be empty when you start your trip as long as you are uh, draining it at the end of your trip. So uh, what that means for you is, is the process is going to be very similar to draining it. Of course we're going to uh, reinstall the anode rod and drain plug here. Uh, we are then going to introduce an inflow of water to the unit. Once we have new water flowing to the unit, we are again going to go to the hot side of any fixture. We're going to turn that hot side on. That flow is initially going to be very airy as it displaces the air within the tank and refills it with water. Once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is our indicator that we do have six gallons of water here in the unit. And we can go ahead and uh, start heating that water Again, choosing whichever source we uh, need at the time. Now, also manufacturer recommends protecting the appliance from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. Uh, as you see here on the lid, we have some louvers and some grating. Uh, mud divers, flying insects, they are attracted to the smell of propane. Uh, they want nothing more but to, to in, uh, intrude this unit and uh, build their dirt nest as close to that flow of propane as they can. Uh, they do sell aftermarket bug screens that will impede them from doing so. Uh, again, it is our, it are, it is our uh, opinion uh, that you should go ahead and, and place those uh, screens to protect the appliance. Uh, we have your outside shower here, uh, access to hot and cold water. We already kind of touched based on that with the draining procedure. Uh, nothing too crazy. Does have an on off uh, on the, does have an on off on the, uh, head, excuse me, uh, to help conserve water consumption, uh, specifically hot water consumption, six gallons of water uh, generally does not translate to an exceptionally long shower. Uh, right above that we have your uh, black water tank flush. Uh, now what that does is that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank, uh, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent feature, uh, but it does have some limitations. Now you're going to want to use the onboard monitor panel on the inside uh, when rinsing that tank uh, to keep that from overflowing. It's very important that you do not overflow that tank when utilizing the black tank flush. Uh, that process is going to go something similar to this. Of course, you're going to hook up a, a wastewater, uh, just standard garden hose to the unit here. Um, as that water is flowing in, you're going to pop on the inside. You're going to hit the button on the monitor panel. Once that tank gets to be two thirds full, we're going to come down here to the dump valve and we're going to go ahead and dump that. Uh, and that's going to be the one here on the right is going to be your sewer outlet connection. Uh, it's very important again, um, because there is no check valve within the system, if we were to let water flow in here indefinitely, the path of least resistance is going to be the rooftop septic vents eventually the contents of that black water tank would uh, essentially rain down uh, from the roof line. So something to keep in mind there. Very, very important that if you do use this, which I do recommend using this every single time you take the unit out, you are monitoring the amount of water that you do push within the tank. Uh, tire pressure lug nuts, it's very important that we talk about those. Uh, lug nuts are, going to, are torqued down to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. Uh, that's the first 10, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. Uh, they want you to make sure you go ahead and stop and retorque those lug nuts down to 100 foot pounds. So, very important that we do so uh, in those intervals. Manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, that we do check and make sure they are maintaining that level of torque. Uh, also, uh, Tire pressure is very important with any trailer tire. We run them at the max tire pressure rating. Uh, you're going to not only find that stamped on the sidewall of the tire, but you're also going to find it here on this data tag, and that's going to be 60 PSI. 60 PSI is the max tire pressure rating. Again, that is exactly where we want to run the, the units, uh, run the tires of the unit. Uh, down low here, if we start uh, right Behind that tire, we have your low point drains. Those are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. So that's how we're going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. 
Uh, we talked about how to drain the water heater, and we talked about how there should be no water within the unit uh, if it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, so when it comes to purging that water from the system, we're going to start with the low point drains. We're of course going to drain those out. Uh, again, just remove the, uh, the plugs on each line. It's a gravity feed system. They're gonna go ahead and, and drain that water there. Then we're gonna hop over to the water heater and we're going to drain that system uh, the way that we previously talked about. Uh, once you've done so, 99% uh, of the water from within the unit is going to be uh, evacuated. It's okay to store the unit in that capacity, uh, as well as that's going to set you up to do a winterization process. Uh, full winterization process is going to be then going, uh, once we've purged all the water from the system, going one step further and introducing antifreeze uh, in place of the water uh, throughout those lines. Uh, and then we have your dump valves here. We have gray water here. Uh, that's going to be your wastewater is going to be gray water. Uh, that's going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. And we have black water here. Of course, as we mentioned previously, black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, both of these valves, as you see them right now, are going to be in the closed position to go ahead and drain them. It's just going to be a six inch pull, in this case towards the rear and in this case towards the ground. Uh, you have a bayonet fitting on each one of those. Uh, your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way the cap comes off. So you have uh, four studs along the outside of that piping. You're gonna go ahead and put that keyhole in the halfway position, give it a quarter turn, that's gonna go ahead and lock it on, whether that be the cap or your sewage hose. Uh, one thing to mention about the Blackwater holding tank here, it is very important that we keep the contents of that tank in as wet or flowing condition as we can. We're gonna do so by keeping that valve in the closed position. Excuse me, we're gonna use the monitor panel on the inside. As that tank fills up, we're then going to dump it. How it, we're going to only dump when either that tank has filled up or we change location. So it's, not, it's gonna be my recommendation that you don't carry your wastewater with you, uh, but it is very important that we keep that closed. Again, our goal is to keep the contents of that black water tank in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Moving on here uh, to the rear of the unit. Uh, of course, uh, entry door is going to be on the rear. Uh, other than that, not too terribly much we need to speak of. You have, of course, uh, up, low, up top, we have uh, marker lights. We have a pre-wire for a backup camera. Does make it very easy to add a camera at any time if you were inclined to do so. Uh, we have a porch light, which we'll get to these on off switch there on the inside. Uh, down low, we have tail lights. We have license plate bracket and light, uh, and we also have your step. Step is very easy. It just folds up and in. So up and in, and then out. And you wanna make sure it seats properly there on the way out. It's very straightforward stuff. Uh, coming around here uh, to the passenger side, uh, we have some all weather 110 volt outlets here. Uh, those are helpful if you wanna go ahead and plug any devices here on the uh, kind of your porch area of the unit with the awning here uh, on the passenger side. Now we also have your uh, furnace here. Uh, that's going to be your furnace exhaust. Couple things to note with that. Number one is of, of course, it is very important that we do protect that from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Number two, with it being kind of located in this porch kind of area, it's very important that we don't restrict the flow. We don't set a lawn chair or anything up in front of it. It is an exhaust. It is very important that we do let it exhaust. Uh, it will blow very hot air when it is on. It may melt whatever you put in front of it. So again, be, be very aware uh, that you do not want to go ahead and restrict the flow with that, but you do want to protect it from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, awning, speakers, things like that we're going to go ahead and get to on the inside. All of those are switched there on the inside. Uh, moving forward here, uh, we have the other side of your uh, compartment here, uh, of your storage compartment here. Uh, it's just a pass-through compartment. Uh, you have latches there on each door to go ahead and hold it open. Uh, I think that just about covers it here on the exterior of the unit. We're going to go ahead and hop on the inside and start going over those features. 
So here within the unit, first up we have is your fire extinguisher. Now that's a very important piece of safety equipment and it is important that we do test our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, in this instance, we're going to go ahead and push this green tab down. If it springs back, that means we have uh, life still left in the unit. Uh, if it stays depressed, that means we need to go ahead and pull it out and uh, replace uh, if it is not holding pressure any longer. Uh, and then we have your 12 volt blower motor there for your furnace. All your heat from within the unit is going to come from this location. We'll talk more about that when we do go ahead and get to the thermostat on how to go ahead and turn that heat on and off. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and open up the bathroom door here and, and talk about that. Uh, here on the, in the side, the bathroom itself, up top here we have a vent fan. This is going to help uh, exhaust any moisture uh, when taking a shower, things like that, uh, go ahead and crank it open. Uh, go ahead and turn it on. It does have four speeds. This is an exhaust only. Again, it is helpful to pull any moisture from the air. Uh, very important that we do go ahead and close it uh, before going down the road. Uh, that's going to, uh, of course, make sure that it is still there when you get to where you're going. Uh, toilet is going to be a, a pedal style flush toilet. Uh, it's going to be located on the right side of the bowl. It's going to be a light press to fill up the bowl with water, uh, full press to flush. It is very important that we use not only a single ply RV grade toilet paper, but also uh, some deodorizing products as well as a tissue dissolver. All of those products are going to be introduced right here at the toilet. Uh, of course, number one, you're going to follow the manufacturer of the product uh, recommendations. Generally, you'll, you'll put those down in here uh, through the commode and then, of course, uh, rinse them or, or, or chase them with a certain amount of water. Generally, it's a gallon or so. Uh, you'll, you'll keep those in place until you dump and then, of course, start that process over. It's going to be my recommendation that you go ahead and keep some uh, chemical treatment within the tank while storing the unit. That's going to help keep things nice and fresh when you do go ahead and pull the tank out of storage. Uh, shower, very easy. Uh, we have, of course, a on-off switch here on the actual head. Uh, access to hot and cold water. Uh, what this is going to do is help you conserve water consumption. Um, again, especially hot water consumption more than anything. Uh, not too terribly much we need to speak of here on the inside. It is very basic, uh, very small bathroom, but it is very functional. So here we have your refrigerator. Uh, if we go ahead and open the door here, uh, we have your controls here on the eyebrow panel. Uh, you can see one through five. You can choose that temperature there. And then if we go ahead and open the, the freezer, uh, towards the rear there, we'll see uh, a another temperature adjustment specifically for the freezer. So what we have here is going to be the on-off toggle switch for the refrigerator. Uh, it's marked as so, and it is clearly marked in the on-off position. That's going to turn the main power on that refrigerator on. Now that is a 12 volt refrigerator. Keep that in mind. It's a 12 volt compressor style refrigerator. Uh, it is very, very easy to use, uh, consumes very little energy, uh, and you should be able to utilize that uh, whether you're boondocking or uh, on grid. Uh, and then beside that, we have your thermostat for your furnace. So if we go ahead and slide this on, we'll hear that blower motor kick on. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. Uh, by that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Um, generally in a unit of this size, by that minute and a half mark, it has went ahead and set off the smoke alarm. Now per manufacturer of the furnace's recommendations, that is totally acceptable operation. Uh, as it runs, continues to run, uh, after about 15 minutes of operation, that efficiency level is going to go way up. It should cease to set off that smoke alarm. Uh, reason for me to tell you that is I don't want you to be alarmed uh, if it does happen. Uh, over here we have your uh, TV. Of course it's on a swivel. It can go ahead and be uh, manipulated around uh, to wherever you choose to uh, align yourself within the camper. Uh, and then if we, look, if we look here, you have your antenna booster. Uh, now that the, you have a button there right between, right beside that green light. Uh, that corresponds or that powers a antenna uh, on the rooftop, which is a omnidirectional digital over-the-air television antenna. 
Uh, if you go ahead and make sure that green light's on, you do a channel search, it's going to automatically bring in the best signal or the best programming dependent on that signal. Very easy to use, uh, very straightforward. Now, if we're utilizing that park cable or that secondary RG6 cable fitting we saw there on the exterior, we're going to go ahead and turn that green light off because they say they share the same pathway. That's going to uh, it's going to allow that signal to go ahead and bleed through, so you can take advantage of a park cable service again. Uh, down below here, we have your uh, main monitor panel. Of course, we have your uh, monitor panel here. This is going to give you a real time readout of where your tanks sit and level of full. We have battery. Battery reads full anytime the unit is plugged into shore power to get a true readout of where that battery sits. We do need to unplug from shore power uh, and then go ahead and test from this location. Fresh water is full. We have that fresh water tank full for testing purposes. Uh, then, of course, black water. Black water is empty as it should be. Gray water is empty as it should be. Now, depending on the floor plan, some of these retros will have a secondary gray water holding tank. Uh, this one does not. So, so pay no attention to that last uh, indicator there marked galley. Uh, we have light switches here. One's going to be the main ceiling lights. Uh, you can choose which lights come on and off with that switch uh, because they are all independently switched. Uh, of course, this is going to be that porch light we saw there on the rear of the unit. Uh, again, simple on off light switch there. We have your water heater switch. Now this is going to be the propane side of your water heater. Uh, so when you turn this water heater switch on, uh, it's going to go through its lighting process. If it does not light by the, it's going to try and light three times. If it does not light by the, the third try, it's going to illuminate this fault light. Uh, what that means is of course it has not lit. Uh, reason generally being either your valve on the tank is closed, either you have no gas left inside the tank, uh, or oftentimes, which is unlikely in a unit of this size, the gas has just made, not had enough time to make its way uh, from the tank or from the, the, the tank to the water heater. Uh, and it, it went through its lighting cycle before it got there. Uh, in any event, go, if the, you see that red light, go make sure that you have gas in the tank, make sure your valve's on, uh, come here, turn that switch off, turn it back on, let it recycle another three times. Uh, as long as you've corrected the issue, you're gonna be in business. Uh, then we have your water pump switch here. Uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, that is to pressurize that potable water or that water tank. Uh, that's going to draw that water up to the fixture and make it usable. And then we have your awning extend and retract switch here. Uh, just so of course you would hold the extend button here. You'd monitor it there uh, on the side of the unit. Make sure you're not going to overextend it. Uh, once you see that valise, uh, that means you are fully extended. Uh, make sure you are retracting it the correct way and actually depressing that strip, uh, that, that switch in the retract position and you're not overextending it. Uh, moving on here to the kitchen area, we have a standard uh, suburban cooktop here. Uh, this is just a standard kind of camping stove setup, very straightforward. Uh, you'll need a long stem barbecue lighter to go ahead and utilize that. Uh, you'll go ahead and turn it to light, uh, stick your lighter directly there on the burner until you see the flame. That will allow you to adjust this uh, higher low there on the knob. Uh, you, of course, have your light here. You have your vent fan there. Uh, all very standard stuff. Up top here, uh, run-of-the-mill turn turntable style microwave. Uh, functions are going to be up at the top, very much of what you're used to. Uh, temperature and time is going to be here uh, on the bottom. Uh, standard run-of-the-mill sink, access to hot and cold water. Again, nothing too uh, crazy. Uh, down low here, we have your fuse panel breaker box. If I go ahead and take a look here, uh, what we have uh, on the right side is going to be your automotive blade style fuses. What we have there on the left side uh, is going to be your 110 volt resettable breakers. Not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of 12 volt fuses, keep them with the unit. Uh, inevitably, you will need to change one at some point in time and it is going to be best suited if you have a spare. Uh, here on this wall, we have your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Uh, that function is very similar to a smoke alarm. Uh, it does have a test button. Uh, you will want to go ahead and make sure, again, that you test it every single time you take the unit uh, out. 
Again, it's hardwired into the 12 volt section of the camper. No batteries to change. It is going to indicate to you uh, which gas it is sensing, uh, dependent on a series of light flashes that you see on the front. Uh, on the underside here, we have your main GFI outlet. Excuse me, all the receptacles within the unit are on the same circuit. This is going to be the reset point that is going to restore functionality to those units in the event that they are overloaded or tripped. Uh, we have another light here, again with all the lights, uh, push the center lens to turn that on. Uh, we have your emergency exit here behind me. Uh, if you're particularly motivated enough and your entry door is blocked, you could go ahead and yank that screen out of the way. This window will open fully uh, like a doggy door. Uh, can also be used as a traditional window in this single position like so. And then again, if we need to exit from that location, we can go ahead and open it up further. Uh, when closing it, we just go ahead and pull this towards us and make sure we latch it back there. Uh, above my head, we have your 9-volt smoke alarm. Uh, this will let you know when it needs to be changed, just like at home has a 9-volt battery. Just like with all the other safety equipment within the unit, it is very important that we do go ahead and test it every single time we take the unit out. Uh, behind me, uh, nothing too crazy to speak of. Of course, all these lights uh, do have independent, uh, independent switches. We have a couple 110 volt outlets, a couple USBs there uh, on the side of the bed. A little bit of storage here up top. Again, nothing too exciting. Uh, above my head, we have the air conditioner. Uh, now you have a single mode button or mode switch here. Uh, this is going to take you through the modes. Now your modes are low fan, high fan, low cool, high cool. So you have two fan settings and two air conditioner settings. Uh, you also have uh, re reusable filters here on each side. If we go ahead and remove this uh, plastic grating that's going to expose the filter, we'd then go ahead and pull that out. If it were dirty, we'd rinse it out in the sink. We'd let it dry before we replaced it up here. All right, so here we have your drive unit. Uh, this is gonna kind of be your multimedia center within the unit. Uh, this is gonna give you function to AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, you have uh, HDMI inlets as you, well as USB inlets, 3.5 millimeter inlets as well. Uh, very easy to use, push that uh, volume knob. Uh, that's going to go ahead and turn it on. Of course, you can control your zones here. Uh, zone one is going to be the speakers in, uh, within the interior. Zone two is gonna be those exterior uh, speakers. We have your display, or excuse me, your mode button here that's going to take you there through the modes. Um, as noted earlier, volume control here, um, presets, very, very basic kind of stereo. Uh, it does have its own service manual. If you do have any questions, either consult the manual or give us a call. If we want to go ahead and turn it off, we just go ahead and, and hold that uh, button in again, and then it's going to go ahead and turn off. Now down below here, we have your jackknife sofa. Very easy, we go ahead and we lift up here on the front. That's going to allow that to go ahead and fold out. Uh, very straightforward, very easy. When we go ahead and fold it back up, we just do the exact opposite. So very, very easy to do, very user friendly. I think we just about covered it here on the in, inside uh, of the retro. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we do hope you enjoyed the walkthrough, thank you.